Okay, great, thank you. Well, as I said, good morning. I know most of you, but not all of you, although I just met one of our newest members, Vivica. My name is Dana Dolanoy, and it is my pleasure to serve as the director of the M Lead Center, uh, succeeding Dr. Rita LaCaruso, who retired at the end of 2019. You can imagine that it's been almost three years. I'd like to just start by thanking each and every member, staff member, core and program leader for their efforts over the last two years to successfully renew our center, all done from our virtual workplaces during the pandemic. I, I just have to pause and think this was quite surreal. <laughs> um, and thank you all. Because of this, we now have the amazing opportunity over the next five years to promote environmental health sciences and help solve some of the world's most complex problems. All right. So for those of you who are thinking about our acronym, MLEAD, this stands for Michigan Center on Life Stage Environmental, little a, and disease. Um, and as many of you know, our mission is to accelerate research that defines impacts of environmental exposures during vulnerable life periods and to promote, and this is particularly important during the, this next five years of our center, the translation of our findings to improve clinical and public health interventions for the mitigation of disease. I'm very excited to see so many of you today in person and on Zoom, and we have just two goals. This is our kickoff meeting, our relaunch first um, for all of us to think about and reconnect with this mission, and then to reintroduce all of you to our amazing resources, our cores and our programs um, that the next five years offers. So as you are aware, we are sitting here in the Midwest. We are particularly aware because it is definitely fall. Um, but over the last several years, we have been joined by several other EHS core centers in the Midwest, as you can see here in the middle, including University of Iowa, Chicago, Cincinnati, Louisville, and Kentucky. So we now have this nice core Midwest center. If you guys can recall all the way back when the founding director, Howard Hugh, um, started the center, we are now in our third five-year cycle, so heading into um, years um, 15. And there are about 20 environmental health sciences core centers across the United States. And the overall mission of these centers from the NIEHS is to advance the scientific research in environmental health sciences, promote community engagement, advance translational research and support the next generation of environmental health sciences researchers. So just a few months ago in July in New York City, the centers had the opportunity to convene and you'll see our picture here. Um, this was from one of the breakfast se sessions with NIEHS director Rick Wojcik, who is here in the middle. Um, Rick Wojcik served um, uh, let us know a lot of interesting statistics about these core centers. So currently there are 26 centers, and this means there are over 1,700 center members across these centers that I showed in the previous map. There's been an amazing product productivity level with over 1,500 publications in the year 2021 alone, and over 100,000 citations from those publications. The um, NIEHS journal, Environmental Health Perspectives, is particularly welcoming of core center publications and has published over 1,000 articles uh, from the core centers. And this is a journal that um, many of us belong to the as associate editors. And I believe now it has an impact factor close to five. I mean, close to 10. <laughs> Sorry about that. And then here on the bottom, you'll see that on our websites and then um, also put up on the um, public environmental health websites, there are over almost 300 individual resources um, for stakeholders and community members that have been produced by these core centers. Rick Wojcik also in July went on um, to talk a little bit about his vision for the centers. Um, and this includes some things that I know are near and dear to a few of us that are here in the room. So for example, he mentioned front and center 
um, increasing and big support for computational biology and data science. He also emphasized the important importance of expanding exposomic research. And over the summer, many of us had the opportunity to participate in virtual Friday afternoon in the summer webinars on exposomics that is really meant to push that field forward and do things that we can do now and also advance exposomics, not only within the NIEHS portfolio, but also within other NIEHS centers. He also enumerated a number of important topics to NIEHS, of which you'll see many of them are front and center in our MLEAD renewal. And these include climate change and health, translational toxicology, and environmental justice and health inequities. So this is the overall figure from the MLEAD renewal. You can see on the outside of this figure, our cores, and on the inside of the figure are programs. So starting at the top, we have the newly named PODS core, Pan Omics in Data Science. This was um, renamed from Obix. And then moving down to the right, we have Integrated Health Sciences, Community Engagement, and Exposure Assessment core. And these cores are joined by several programs, the Translational Research Program, a Career Development Program, and a pilot project program. And the administrative core attempts to oversee all of this great activity. So you'll be hearing in more detail from the leaders of these cores and programs in a moment. So who makes up MLEAD? All of you make up MLEAD. We couldn't do this without you. I am joined um, by Deputy Director John Meeker, who's here in the room. He is a professor of environmental health sciences and um, the senior associate dean for research at the School of Public Health. John and I are joined by Associate Directors Gil Oman, who is a professor of bioinformatics, and Vasantha Padmanabhan, who's a professor of pediatrics and OBGYN, as well as environmental health sciences and nutritional sciences. And so the leadership spans both basic sciences into clinical and translational science on purpose so that we can help advance the mission from molecules to communities. Our overall membership um, also embraces this variety and includes over 70 members representing five of the six departments in the School of Public Health, as well as eight medical school departments, representatives from LSNA, as well as regional membership. Um, we have members from University of Michigan Dearborn, including our new Keck co-lead, um, Natalie Sampson, who's joining us on Zoom, as well as um, members from Michigan State University. I'd like to um, pause during to show our um, overall center structure to acknowledge one of our newest members, although it's been a year now, this might be the first time that some of you have met Rose Brandstrom, who's shown here at the bottom of the figure. Rose is our center administrator for MLEAD and joined us in August of 2021 virtually um, during the pandemic and has done just an amazing job um, responding to all of the things we needed to do to secure our funding, which came through on June 16th, 2022, as well as plan this kickoff meeting. So Rose, thank you very much. Rose took over um, for Michelle Dowd, who moved in summer of 2021 to the Cancer Center. So some of you have um, been able to still interact with Michelle. And I also wanted to give a shout out to Michelle because she was so um, dedicated to submitting the two renewals that we did in April and May, April of 20 and May of 2021 um, to get us to this point. So we thank you also, Michelle. So in addition to the leadership team that I um, introduced on the previous slide, you can now see our leadership in our translational research team. Um, this includes our cumulative exposures and population health led by Karen Peterson and Erica Jansen climate change and health disparities led by Toby Lewis and Karina Grunlaub, as well as toxico toxicological mechanisms and health outcomes led by Vasantha Padmanabhan and Lori Savoda. 
We also have three facility cores, but that's a little bit misleading. We have exposure assessment core led by Stuart Batterman and John Meeker. We have on the bottom pan omics and data science led by Maureen Sarter and Jackie Goodrich. But here in the middle, we have the integrated health sciences core, which um, you'll hear about in great detail in a minute, but this is also where our biostatistics core services are housed. Um, which is led by Lu Wang, and the overall core is led by Marie O'Neill and Sung Kyun Park. Finally, we have our community engagement core, which is led by Amy Schultz, Barbara Israel, and Natalie, who I just mentioned, and our pilot program, which John leads as well. One of the things I wanted to just take one small minute to point out during the next five-year cycle is this new emphasis that the NIEHS has on the translational research framework. We spent a lot of time in the proposal generating figures um, that modeled after this, this figure from their um, publication that came out in Environmental Health Perspectives in 2018. So this is a framework that's now being incorporated into many NIEHS portfolios. And it has these concentric circles that move from fundamental questions or basic science to application and synthesis, implementation and adjustment, the practice, and finally the impact. And you can see here in the black triangles, the impacts could be a change in population outcomes, a change in policy as well. And so on the right side in the text here, you can see how MLEAD has incorporated the translational research framework into our center. I don't wanna read all of the overall aims because I can see my time is getting a little short, but these are here for you all to um, quickly look at. These are the overall aims of the center. And we also have aims for each of the cores and programs. Um, we are here at the University of Michigan. We are able to build on a strong foundation of environmental health sciences um, research. Some of the things that we will do in this cycle is reach out to additional partners across the campus, including some of the new emphasis on um, sustainability and climate, um, partnering with some uh, faculty and staff members in CS. We also want to foster integration and coordination across campus and build programmatic and scientific capacity. And then finally, last but certainly not least, engage with affected communities via equitable partnerships in multi-directional manners. And we'll hear a little bit about this in a few minutes. So today, as I mentioned, you'll hear from our cores and their leaders. Um, we will also have presentations from our translational research team leaders. Um, who are um, this is this is a new part of our center. As you may remember, our previous teams were very mechanistic based, like epigenetics and genomics, oxidative stress, endocrine disruptors. That is all still there, incorporated within these teams. But we're moving it into the translational research framework. And at the end of our time here, we will have a talk from our Keck member, Dr. Simone Char Charles, who presented this um, work in July at the center meeting on the road to scientific workforce discovery, many paths in one destination. And then finally, at the end, we will have time for networking and we will have some refreshments that come out um, towards the end of the meeting. Right now there is coffee and water, so please feel free to get up um, and stretch your legs and also enjoy the refreshments. And with that, I am going to pass the podium virtually now over to uh, Dr. Marie O'Neill, who is on Zoom, and will give the presentation for the Integrated Health Sciences Corps. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Dana. Good morning, everyone. So I am pleased to co-lead this Integrated Health Sciences Corps with my colleagues Sung Kyun Park and Lu Wang, who are pictured on the left side of the slide, and then other valuable members of our team are Dan McConnell, who leads the class lab, which I'll speak about. <clears throat> Meredith McGee, who you've seen many emails from, um, who's supporting us in many dimensions. Robin Wiley, our web guru. And then our newest collaborator is Zhang Zhe, who is going to be assisting with biostatistical support. Next slide, please. So overall, the aim of our core is to facilitate interaction and strengthen connections between research, 
community and practice. And so it's multidirectional. We want to hear from practitioners and community members um, and then enhance our translation of the research findings into practice. And we've been working very closely with the Community Engagement Corps, and you'll hear, hear more um, from them. But as you can see, our aim and our mission um, necessitates that kind of engagement. Next slide, please. So our overall aims, um, first, an important function is to consult with center members um, on statistical methods. Second, we want to work with and train our members to ensure quality of research design and other elements of environmental health sciences, including maximizing use of human animal biobanks that we have here at the University of Michigan. We also want to promote these collaborations. And so two of our highlight events are uh, an environmental statistics day, which will be occurring uh, very soon, October 24th, and then an environmental health practice uh, workshop. We also have an important function of maintaining our repository kiosk, which tells about the resources available, and we will soon be updating that. And then finally, and most importantly, it's catalyzing these partnerships with practitioners and community members so that we're pursuing research that really connects to action. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the repository kiosk, which we maintain on our website. And the idea is so people who ask questions about I want to study this issue. Might there be biosamples or other data available that can help me enhance the research? Next slide. And then I, I mentioned Dan McConnell, who's not with us today, but he directs the class laboratory, Central Ligand Assay Satellite Services Laboratory, but they're also all about promoting and, and helping with collaborative research. So they have service functions to help with biosample collection kits, analytical assay services, and then storage. And they're a certified entity um, who you can contact if you need some of these services. Next slide, please. Um, again, the biosample collection kit design and build I've listed here are a few of the types of samples um, that the class lab helps with. And the idea is to design these kits to really facilitate um, both collection and tracking of these samples. Next slide, please. Assay services um, are for a, a large variety of um, biological parameters listed here. And they also have more that you can um, assay if you wish listed on the website. Next slide. And then last but not least, storage. Um, the class lab has freezer space free of charge for our members. Um, and it's monitored and protected so that if there's a loss of power, um, you, you don't lose your valuable samples. So with that, I believe I will turn the presentation over to Lu Wang to tell us about the statistics consulting services. Okay, thank you, Murray. Um, okay, so in our core, we actually provide a lot of statistics consulting services. And our service actually is built upon the university's uh, resources. They actually have um, like Mitar, Saber, or CISGAR, and different type of consulting services. So in our core, we do not duplicate their services. And instead, we will provide a referral for this basic methodological or grant development advice. And in the meanwhile, uh, if you have you know, more complicated situation, we also provide more targeted and advanced method consultation that is required or requested by our center members to advance the environmental health research. Um, 
In the meanwhile, we also promote the use of cutting edge statistical methods to address those significant environmental health science uh, research pri priorities. So some of these examples are um, if you have high dimensional data and how to reduce them and put the multiple uh, pollutants together in, uh, into one composite or into some uh, variables that could be explained and interpretable. And the other uh, example would be like, for example, if you have a relationship between your house outcome versus some exposures, and this uh, relationship is nonlinear, and we would love to explore some non-parametric or semi-parametric or functional data analysis to allow those flexibilities for the dependence special inter inter interpolation of the environmental exposure data or the how to integrate data from multiple data resources. And uh, all of those will be some examples for these cutting edge uh, statistical methods. Another thing I want to mention specifically is in our core, we actually have expertise about missing data, um, correlated data, and also causal inference. So if you have some scientific questions that can be answered or would love to be answered in the causal inference framework, please feel free to reach out. And um, the most important thing is our consultants is actually free to all our members. So feel free to reach out. And Zhongzhi, as Marie just mentioned earlier, um, he will be our uh, junior person or hands-on person to do the analysis. And I will supervise all the analysis or the uh, uh, design for your studies. Another component our core is providing is to disseminate the knowledge of the advanced statistical methods. And in the past, we have hosted the uh, Environmental Statistics Day Symposium or during the pandemic, that is the Environmental Statistics Week. And we'll continue that this year. And that, uh, that's going to happen in um, October 20, uh, yeah, it's on October 24th. Um, the other thing is that that is something new we are thinking about, you know, for this year or maybe in the next few years, we are going to host the environmental statistics practice workshop so that you could come to, uh, together to the workshop with your scientific questions or your studies and we'll help you with your study design, power and sample size calculations and come up with some anal analysis plan. And here's a very nice poster. Uh, Meridas has helped us with this environmental statistic day. And um, the, uh, uh, during, the, during that day, we will have um, Professor Ziegler um, to deliver the keynote address. And then the other thing is following that, we actually have the invited panel that will feature professors um, Rod Little, Tim Devoch, and Sarah Ada from Epidemiology. Uh, Tim is from the Environmental Health Sciences. Rod is from Biostatistics. So it will be a very interesting and nice panel to have different expertise to discuss this topic. And just put that on your calendar. And then the location is in the uh, in person uh, in School of Public Health in the room 1680. And with that, I'm going to hand to Song Yang. Good morning. Uh, I'm Song Yun Park. So uh, I will uh, introduce the uh, other activity that so this uh, integrated integrated health science core is doing, and one of them is that, as Marie mentioned earlier, that. Um, you know, educate and uh, teach our center member in terms of this uh, environment. So cross-cutting environmental health uh, research uh, topics. And, and one of them is uh, provide this public health practice consultation for researchers and community and governor, government and the industry. And so every year we, are, uh, we have this environmental health practice. Uh, as you may remember that, so this environmental health practice uh, mainly uh, organized by our uh, former member, uh, Tris Komen, uh, and she uh, she's now uh, moved to 
uh, EPA. And so, but we will continue this environmental health practice workshop uh, every year and uh, working closely with uh, community engagement core. And the goal of this uh, practice workshop is to enhance these professional skills uh, and communication leadership, uh, public comments, and uh, community engagement. So uh, on the right side, you can see the, the this workshop we did last year about um, the making Tosca work. So how this uh, Tosca um, uh, is is working as it is designed, or how can we um, you know improve this Tosca and, and as it it was designed. And, and uh, this slide show, uh, you know, several, uh, this workshop that we did before. So including this climate change and health and also how this systematic review can, uh, can help uh, evaluate this population level, uh, those toxicity from endocrine uh, disrupting chemicals. And also we, uh, we have this uh, health equity in industrial scale about uh, this Tosca related uh, issue. And uh, another uh, the activity that we do is, so as you may receive uh, this uh, seminar information from uh, Meredith, and then this environmental research seminar happened uh, Tuesday lunchtime. And this is an interdisciplinary forum. So we bring uh, you know, scientists from locally or uh, you know, uh, outside of the university and then uh, learn about their cross-cutting uh, you know, research topic. And so the last year, so I will not go over whole, but last year we uh, brought uh, fantastic speakers and then talk about this interesting topic. And one of them, as you can see on the right side is that you know, our uh, own uh, members, so Aurora Lee and um, the Marianne Rosenberg talking about the sustain, sustaining on a healthy nail salon workforce in Michigan. Uh, so this year we will continue. So we, we had one, uh, this environmental uh, research seminar. And, and so the next slide, we will show also the resident and uh, researchers are in our, um, the series. And, and then, uh, so this seminar will be, uh, approximately bi-monthly during lunchtime on Tuesday. And because of, so we want to uh, keep this 15 minute uh, timeline. So that's why this is, uh, this happened uh, through the Zoom. And then we have this, uh, uh, another uh, good speaker series for this year. And then, uh, so the next week, we will have uh, our first environmental research seminar by uh, Dr. Rita Strakowski from MSU about this inter, uh, interplay of a maternal uh, diet with environmental exposure in pregnancy. Uh, so the here, actually this is uh, mainly uh, led by uh, our uh, community uh, engagement core and uh, Amy Schultz. Uh, and then she may uh, talk more about this, but just give you uh, very briefly. So another, uh, the, uh, the activity that we are doing is uh, we bring this uh, community partner and the scientists together and talk about uh, pressing environmental health issue. And then over the past uh, year, so we talk about this uh, many issue in uh, Southeast Michigan, Detroit area, water issue, and then uh, electricity, and then uh, health disparity issue. And this year, so the, you may uh, attend uh, this meeting a few days ago about this PBB in Michigan, empowering an exposed community. And um, two weeks, uh, so we will have another uh, RNR &R about this water and public health uh, inequity and affordability. So this is the last slide. And so you can see the whole uh, series of this activity uh, uh, coordinated by this, our core and uh, community engagement core. Okay, Ted. Great, thank you so much. Now we're gonna hear from our community engagement core and we do have um, one virtual presenter too. Natalie, do you wanna try talking? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. So we're good. I'm here. <laughs> Let's check it now. She's not a panelist yet, so you okay. All right, good morning, everybody. Really delighted to be here. Um, my name is Amy Schultz. I am on the faculty in the Department of Health Behavior and Health Education. 
and have a, the distinct pleasure of co-leading uh, the community engagement core since the center started with Barbara Israel. And we've been recently joined by Natalie Sampson, um, which is a wonderful addition to our team. Uh, Lapricia Daniels, I am hoping is going to be joining us also as a presenter. She is the lead for our stakeholder advocacy board uh, and the executive director of Detroiters Working for Environmental Justice. Okay, and our role today is going to be to provide a little bit of background about who we are as the Community Engagement Corps and also introduce our stakeholder advocacy board, which is our community uh, representation. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about who we are and what we do. So these are our four aims for the Community Engagement Corps. Um, as you can see, central to our work is establishing and sustaining partnerships with stakeholders. A majority of our, of our partners on the Stakeholder Advocacy Board are based in Southeast Michigan and they represent public health um, and a number of advocacy um, organizations and community-based organizations working in the field of, of environmental health. We see the Stakeholder Advocacy Board as fundamental to the other three aims that we have, um, which are to facilitate communication between community members, policymakers, and public health decision makers, and MLEAD members. So to get, oh, there's Lapricia. I welcome Lapricia. <laughs> to get the work of the center out to decision makers and other important audiences who may use um, the, our, our research to inform decision making and, um, and, and action. We also um, have as our, our third aim here is to increase awareness of researchers about emergent community environmental health issues and work that is going on in the community towards the end of having the research itself be informed by community priorities and to try to make those linkages more explicit and our, the, our research more meaningful when we get to the translation phase. And then our fourth aim is to advance the field of community engagement and environmental health communication through our work with evaluation, dissemination, and promotion. And I want to introduce Chris Kuhn, who uh, takes the lead on our evaluation work uh, and is joining us here today. Just a quick note to point out that the functions of the Community Engagement Core tie directly to NIH, um, NIEHS goals for promoting translation. Our first aim of creating partnerships links explicitly to goal number six, which is creating partnerships for action um, around environmental health issues. Our aim two um, addresses several of the translational goals from NIEHS, including outreach, communication, and engagement um, in goals three, four, and five that are listed here on this slide. And our aim three, our, our aim three, uh, connects directly to uh, the, the uh, NIEHS's focus on communicating issues and concerns of communities who are experiencing excess environmental health risks um, to our researchers so that it can for, inform the research and then getting that work back out, um, those findings back out to inform their, those decision-making processes. This is the Community Engagement Corps. This is who we are. Please reach out to us. We would love to talk to you about your research and how it can be informed by community um, uh, leaders and advocates who are doing work in environmental health and also how that we can help to translate um, your work to others, um, uh, to those who may, may use your findings. I'm gonna turn it over at this point to Lapricia. <laughs> who arrived just in time. <laughs> oh, uh, yes, I do. All right, uh, good morning. Uh, <laughs> Sorry for, yeah, parking was fine. There's was, there was a little bit of traffic, but parking was fine. All right, so, um, the first aim of the Community Engagement Corps is to create and sustain partnerships between community reps and academic members of the Emily Center. Um, so uh, Amy already showed who our stakeholder advocacy, I'm sorry, no, you showed the the core, I'm sorry. So I am actually the co-chair of our stakeholder advocacy board. 
Um, and the Stakeholder Advocacy Board has worked together to develop a set of core principles uh, or guiding values that underlie Emily's community partnership efforts. And these include uh, having shared decision-making, equitable distribution of resources, joint dissemination, so collaboratively identifying outlets, co-authorship, co-presentation, and community identified concerns or priorities. And this is our stakeholder advocacy board, which is a representative of um, multi-sectoral partnership that helps to lead the work. Um, members of the board represent important community constituencies who are involved with environmental justice advocacy, uh, provide healthcare to residents from environmental justice communities, and who are broadly engaged in efforts to promote public health in Southeast Michigan communities. You can see on this slide, the representatives who are members of the Stakeholder Advocacy Board. And the role of the SAB is to strengthen dialogue and interaction between the Emily Center and community stakeholders and to assure that the center researchers have an understanding of community concerns and needs and priorities. So each uh, CEC must establish a stakeholder advisory board um, to facilitate and strengthen multi-directional interaction between EHSCC and partners. Uh, the SAB has worked together to identify priority environmental health topics for Southeast Michigan residents, which include access to clean water and air, the impact of environmental exposures for both maternal and infant health outcomes, the urgent need to address climate change and mitigate, it, mitigate its adverse health impacts in Southeast Michigan communities and beyond, uh, the impacts of large scale chemical contaminations and strategic actions needed to prevent them in the future, the impact of environmental exposures for education and learning and gentrification and displacement, including green gentrification that occurs as formerly contaminated urban communities are cleaned up and become more desirable. All right, dosey -si dose. Uh, hi, everybody. Barbara Israel in the Department of Health Behavior and Health Education. And as Amy said, I'm delighted to be the co lead with Amy and now Natalie Sampson and working closely with Lapricia. So I just want to say a little bit about our. Our aim three is really about assuring that the science produced by Emily researchers reaches audiences who can do something with that information, can act on that information, can bring about policy change, for example. And so some of our audiences include organizations and community leaders with the capacity to reach Southeast Michigan residents and other communities experiencing excess environmental risk, Another primary audience is we put a focus on Southeast um, Michigan youth, uh, who we consider to be poised for the next generation of environmental health researchers, advocates, and decision makers. Natalie will say more about that in just a minute. And also policy and public health decision makers in Southeast Michigan and selected other communities experiencing emergent environmental risks. And some of the ways that we do that to reach those audiences are through um, fact sheets for community audiences. That's what these are pictured here. Uh, information around how ways to reduce lead in water, uh, information on uh, extreme heat, information on household flooding in Detroit. And all of these fact sheets are put together based on the literature, based on talking to lead researchers. Some, a number of you have reviewed these over the years as we, we produce them and update them and we really appreciate that. Um, and they're, again, they're really meant for community audiences. In addition, we do policy briefs uh, for administrative and elected decision makers as our audience. And these are really to distill key environmental issues and, and findings for example, around aging water infrastructure in terms of how they can use this information to try to make legislative decisions and policy decisions. And also about every two years, we've convened a legislative forum in Lansing to engage legislators directly in information brought to them from our MLEAD scientists. Topics have include air quality, water infrastructure, and large scale chemical contaminations. 
Um, and then some of the ways that the CAC and the SAB can support building partnerships and the work that you all do as lead researchers um, is we have a, a small planning grant program where we provide $5,000 to community and academic partners that want to get together and start a new partnership. Uh, and we provide some technical assistance capacity building work along with that funding. We also have worked closely with the pilot project and John and others uh, where, as you know, many of you, most of you know, $25,000 goes for the pilot project grants, but you can get an additional $5,000 if you're working with the Keck and the community partner organizations. And we engaged in facilitating that process. Some of the topics that we've looked at have been climate vulnerability, conducting a health impact assessment of Detroit's energy's integrated resource plan, um, and examining the emergence of environmental knowledge and leadership in communities that have experienced large scale chemical contamination such as PBB. Now I'd like to turn it over to Natalie. And I, are you, I don't know, do I have to do anything to make that happen? I think I'm here, am I here? <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, we're, uh, we're keeping busy just like the rest of you. Thanks everyone for letting me zoom in. So I'm just going to mention um, one one initiative that the the Keck supports that the um, SAB is able to guide, and this really lines up with AIM two. But I would say it lines up with all of our aims um, in that we're able to work with youth as both an audience, but also kind of moving back and giving them some space and, and pathways to move into this work. And so the Environmental Health Research to Action program started in 2017 as a community academic partnership. It's focused on building skills in community science and policy advocacy and um, lines up with this, this mission of addressing cumulative environmental exposures. It started um, as Dearborn based, but it has grown to be throughout Metro Detroit. Um, some of you have seen this video before. We're working with high school students this summer. They um, were out with air quality monitors um, doing handheld projects that they designed. Some of them were in the Rouge River kayaking and collecting water samples. So it's a really fun initiative and um, really powerful. So we're going to just show this video because it speaks for itself. If you can help me out on that end. I live in the south end of Dearborn, which is highly polluted. It is unclean. It smells so bad. I ended up getting asthma. I never realized the amount of toxins and chemicals that are going into our bodies. They would have um, like a little machine and they'd put it in my mouth and it would help me breathe better. My cousin like three months ago, he died because of the asthma. Everyone's getting affected. It's just sad. I can't just stay and do nothing about it. All these factories just, just disgusting. I'd love it if more people my age were informed of stuff going on around them and the stuff going on in the community. There's a lot of desensitization. People feel that, oh, well, it's foregone. There's nothing really we could do. When in reality, the time is now to stop polluting. If not now, then when? The people who are causing pollution don't know that it's affecting themselves too. There's no boundaries for pollution. It kind of like, hurt my heart a little bit to know that people had to fight so hard for something that you shouldn't need you have to fight for. Can you imagine for 40 years we've been exposed to numerous chemicals without our knowledge? The slags, all my life I thought that it was a pile of dirt. That's not dirt, that's slag. Full of manganese. Their houses are right there. These communities' voices are often ignored and they're often used by big companies for their own profit and gain. I think it's now our time to interact with our environment in a healthier, more conscientious way. I found ERA as a way for myself to get hands-on interaction with not only seeing the environmental issues on a daily basis, but also uh, meeting people who are on the front end of trying to solve the issues. This academy will help spread the voice of our community to advocate our environmental issues. If we don't try and fix it or solve the issue, it's going to get worse and it's going to affect younger generations. I want to do something for my community. So I think by joining ERA, I could not only help myself, but also help the community as a whole. It's not like you can stop it. But it doesn't mean we can't at least slow it down. Thanks, Rose. 
Oh, uh, a little elevator music to go out. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hi, there we go. There we go. Uh, <laughs> Natalie, you get to keep talking. How about that? Okay. Um, so I just want to share that because, um, you know, this, this Academy happens every year in July for a solid month. And we bring in all sorts of, you could see lots of faces. Some of you probably recognized, and we really just want to encourage folks at the Emily center to know that they can engage with you, that they can share their expertise. And, and that's one way, um, to make connections across across the course. So we bring in a lot of scientists to talk with them. Um, we have one of those students who's now a senior at University of Michigan doing an honors thesis on fugitive dust. So it's really exciting to see what comes of that. So we're getting towards wrapping up on our section. I just wanna share a few upcoming events. Um, you are all well aware now of the residents and researchers, but we have a few exciting ones. Um, one including water and public health with an SAB member, Monica Lewis-Patrick, who many of you know, as well as some of her colleagues and partners working on water um, inequities and affordability. So check that out. There's a link to register. As well as on the next slide, um, an exciting, um, in-person event, if you want to click to the next one, um, a tour related to the Gordie Howe Bridge that's being built in um, Southwest Detroit. So for those of you who are curious about the health impact assessment, the air monitoring that's been going on, again, you'll see names from a few different folks affiliated with the Emily Center and um, community partners who have been really leading, leading this work. So we hope some of you can get on the bus. Um, you can join from Ann Arbor, you can join from Detroit and um, check out what's going on and ask some questions and uh, really see some real world environmental health and justice issues. So I think I pass it back over to my friends there in the room. Actually, Natalie, it's Allison. Can you hear me? Yep, yep, we can hear you. Great. I just wanted to put this slide up. I know we're out of time. These are some past highlights um, of the work that we've been doing and the work that we're excited to continue to do. And on the next slide is we are very excited this year. We started an, an initiative to be on social media. So we welcome anybody uh, to follow us on social media. And if you have information you'd like us to push out, we would be happy to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. And now it's up to Maureen and Jackie. Okay. Great. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to see you all here. And I can't see who's on Zoom. So hello to everyone on Zoom. Um, so I, I'm the lead of the pan, new Panomics and Data Science core. Um, so I'll, I'll introduce myself first, and then Jackie will introduce herself. So um, many of you know me, but I'm Maureen Sarder, I'm professor of computational medicine and bioinformatics. Um, I've been leading bioinformatics for this center since its inception, uh, I think 17 years ago now. And even before that, I was at University of Cincinnati working in their Center for Environmental Genetics and IEHS um, Center. So I have a long record of collaborating with uh, environmental health scientists and bioinformatics. This, uh, this round of funding, we decided to uh, changed the name from Omics and Bioinformatics Core to Panomics and Data Science Core to re reflect the the changes in technology and um, and data science uh, explosion kind of uh, um, that has occurred. And so, um, really, so what my lab has done uh, you know analysis across a broad range of different types of omics data analysis. And we can also handle um, different types of data science, machine learning algorithms um, to help you. So we wanted to kind of reflect that change in, in our expanded ability. Uh, Jackie, you want to introduce? Hi, I'm Jackie Goodrich. I know most of you. I, I was the center scientist back in 2014, and I'm excited to be back having a, a new role in the center after a, Laura Rosick left her new university. So I'll be co-leading with Maureen, representing more of the lab side of things for omics. I've done a lot of lab work in, in human populations with epigenomics and metabolomics as well. So I can help with you know study design and how to collect the best samples and things like that when you wanna do 
this type of work. Thanks, Jackie. So, um, so pods will support a, a broad range of omics based approaches. Um, our goal is to, as it says, deliver cutting edge analytic methods. Um, so our, our goal is to service uh, all the different stages through a, a high throughput research study, starting from the very beginning of study design, sample collection and prep, um, technology platform choice. So those three areas are more in the realm of, of Jackie. Um, when you start getting into technology platform choice, I can also help with that. And then with the data analyses, um, not just the basic analyses, but really going the last mile to the publication. So integration and interpretation of results, um, you know, integrating with publicly available data when appropriate, um, creating the visualizations and, and figures for the, the paper. Um, and we can also help you help facilitate your interactions with other key U of M resources. So um, I'll say a little bit more about that on this slide. So here's our team. So um, some of you may know Kai Wang, he's in the, the back here today. Um, he is, has been the pods data scientist for a few years now. And uh, a new member just this semester is Tina Lee. She was an incoming bioinformatics master's student. Um, Snehal Patil is a software developer. She works in my lab, but also works part-time in the Precision Health Initiative. And uh, you want to introduce Rebecca? Yeah, and Rebecca Pe Petroff is a current center scientist and a postdoc working with Dana and I, and she, she's an expert once again in, well, She's done a lot of epigenomic state analysis, but also a lot of lab work and can help with, you know, candidate gene versus omics wide approaches and, and decisions like that for your team. So new this round of funding um, to go along with our pan omics uh, approach. We have a, a number of kind of domain specific faculty who are, are have a small amount of percent effort on pods. Uh, so uh, Alexi, Alexi Nedvesky, uh, his expertise is in proteomics, Betsy Foxman uh, in microbiome, Ala Konofsky in metabolomics, and Lana Garmeyer with single cell technologies. And so they are available for consultations. So our core goals, um, there's three of them. So the first is, as I kind of already described, somewhat provide comprehensive support throughout the entire range of a study. Secondly, um, we ourselves are developing novel data science methods and approaches, tools to try to help meet the needs, not only of MLEAD members, but also other environmental health scientists across the world. Um, and thirdly, you know, we're here to try to help promote collaborations um, uh, between all of you and with bioinformaticians and other data scientists. Um, to work on environmental health projects. And we'll do that through workshops and seminars. Some of you may remember our summer omics series that we had a um, few years, and uh, it, I'd like to, to start those back up again. Uh, so here's a list of the specific approaches. I won't go through all these. I know we're kind of um, behind on schedule, but um, just here's the, the list. Uh, will these slides be made available? Great, okay. Um, so yeah, and then on, on the right-hand side, in addition to kind of specific uh, technologies that we'll analyze the data for, we'll also do kind of downstream analyses like pathway analyses, integration, prediction and classifications, um, development of websites, and um, uh, if you're planning to use Michigan Genomics Initiative, we can help facilitate interactions with them as well. Um, so this is kind of an example workflow. I realize this looks kind of busy, but basically, you know, it starts with your initial request, basically just an email to Jackie or myself saying you're interested in, in meeting with us. Uh, we would have an initial meeting, uh, depending on what stage you're already at, if you're at the beginning, then to discuss your study design and platform choice and so on. Um, and then depending on whether you want us to, uh, to help with some development, of a website or a database, then we would then pull in Snehal. If you're doing a high throughput study, then we um, you would do the sample collection preparation. It would then go off to, <coughs> to 
to the, the core for the data generation. So what the core does is are the boxes listed in green. Um, depending on the type of omics data, uh, we may be able to do the initial quality control and analysis, or those initial steps might be done with the core. And um, so then at, at some certain stage, then the data would come to us, and then we can do more of the downstream analyses and integration and help you publish the manuscript. So I'll go over a, a few of our successes and current projects. Um, so one was we developed a, a novel single cell analysis method that incorporated more accurate variance estimation between groups. So this was funded by um, the Mishar Statistics Pilot Grant. Um, and then secondly, uh, we created software for joint analysis of two different types of uh, epigenomics data. And this tool was then applied to multiple MLAID studies uh, to study bisphenol A exposure. So um, just to kind of give you an idea of some of the things that uh, my postdoc Kai Wang has been working on, um, and he's also been a pods data scientist. He was a scientist in 2019, or sorry, yeah, 19 and 2020. Um, so on the left, you see a project he's been working with, with uh, Lori's Boboda and Dana Dolanoy, integrating um, reduced representation by sulfite sequencing with RNA-seq, uh, looking at lead exposure and DEHP exposure at three different time points in mouse. And so it's a fairly complicated experimental design. And so you see a really nice figure that he put together after analyzing all of that data. On the right-hand side, you see a, a single cell RNA-seq study that uh, we're currently working on with Yoshi Holoshitz, um, studying um, uh, macrophages, um, changes in macrophages uh, that can lead to autoimmune diseases. A couple additional projects he's been working on on the left is um, PyRNA analysis and creating a database uh, to publish with several different um, PyRNA um, uh, creation studies. Um, and this is with uh, Dan Dolan and Penny uh, Pereira. And then on the right, this is an example of uh, uh, methods research that I've been working on with Kai, and uh, as well as Justin Colacino uh, representing the environmental health side of it. Um, so this is, uh, it's a um, coupled tensor matrix completion method. So the idea is, is that uh, you, there are a lot of chemicals being produced that are understudied and their target genes are unknown. Uh, and so we're trying to, at a, at a global big scale, predict the target genes uh, of these chemicals using all of the information and databases that is already available, as well as all the information on um, relationships and similarities between environmental chemicals and relationships and uh, similarities known among genes. And so um, he, he has a, a paper under review for this right now, as well as a K99 um, uh, being resubmitted shortly. Uh, a couple of examples of projects that Snehal Patil has worked on. Um, on the left, you see a, a website that she developed uh, for my lab, and we've used this, uh, this tool for a number of different MLAID projects already. And then on the, on the right is some work on a website that she did with the Precision Health Initiative. Um, and so this is uh, with the, um, um, I forget the name of it, Ex Express Web, I guess. Uh, so just to illustrate kind of the, the types of GUI and forms that she can create on a website. So if anyone would like to, you know, disseminate their, their data in this way, then she can help you work on that. So uh, another success is that we recently got funded the uh, ALS, NIH Transformative R01 study, uh, with four PIs, all of them MLAID Center members. Um, including myself. And so the, the title of this is Developing Novel Strategies for Personalized Treatment and Prevention of ALS, lever Leveraging Global Exposome, Genome, Epigenome, Metabolome, and Inflammasome with Data Science in a Case Control Study Cohort. So this is an excellent example of the kind of panomics um, focus that we're having this, uh, this next round of funding. 
Um, this is a, a large cohort with over 700 samples. And uh, we already have a, a ton of data coming in for this. So um, myself and Ala Karnofsky are leading AIM-2 of this grant that includes the, the epigenome, transcriptome, and metabolome, and then performing mini multiomics integration, and as well as working closely with um, those working on the genomic side and the environmental side. So in summary, we're here and ready to support your research. Uh, all you need to do is, is email us. Um, like the uh, environmental statistics, our services are free. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the sequencing of course is not free, but our data analysis and consultations are free. Um, myself and, and Jackie are the, the contacts for service requests. And you know, our, so our, our help of Emily Center members can, uh, can range from anywhere between just one single meeting consultation to really long-term, you know, years long commitments. Um, so, and finally watch for future training and seminar sessions in the coming years. And I think that's my last slide. Yep, thanks. Good morning, my, I'm John Meeker, presenting the Exposure Assessment Corps. Stuart Batterman is uh, in Portugal at the Exposure Science Conference, and I must say I'm pretty jealous, but we'll get through this. Um, so I'm here to talk about the Exposure Assessment Corps. So the purpose is to provide, as with the other cores, provide consultation and connect the, the researchers and center members with the appropriate methodologies to, to best do their work. Um, and that can stretch into providing the actual analytical services or connecting you with, with uh, laboratories we have relationships with um, for, for discounted rates and, and uh, optimal service. Um, we also are looking to uh, stretch the performance and capacity of these measurements and then uh, disseminate some of these methods to the public, both their availability and also, you know, if we could um, validate new methods to be used for something uh, like citizen, citizen science, for example, um, like in that video where people were using different monitors, how best can we get that quality down to that level? So some services, uh, initial consultations, um, assistance with collection, processing, and storage of samples, um, sample analysis, as I said, method development and, and referrals. Quality assurance, so exposure measurements are only as good as the how well you can trace their quality. Um, they can break down at a lot of different points, so we help with that as well, um, and, and validations. Once you get the data, um, again, you might need help interpreting, comparing with, with the appropriate populations and things like that. And we can also work on uh, modeling. So you get the raw data, that's usually not the best form to use that data. Uh, for a particular application, so we can do that as well. Outreach and education and uh, training and professional development. So there's Stuart, again, enjoying himself in Portugal and, <laughs> and myself. So we're the two main contacts uh, for consultation if you have questions um, and you'd like to use some services. I know we have a hard cutoff at 10, 11 precisely for the break, so I'll, I'll go quickly here. But there's a, a lot of different scientists involved, a broad range of, of career stage and uh, diversity of, of expertise um, that we can draw upon. Um, and Stuart, Stuart also wanted to show this, that the, the, the core itself has, has served for um, career development for a lot of people, and he continues to uh, collaborate with many of these folks that have served in the, in the, core, in the core as well. So the, the primary laboratory that's in the core is, is run by Stuart and that's organic chemistry. He has some um, new equipment, GCMS, uh, GCTNMS, um, that can be helpful in a lot of different applications, both media wise. So it could be a biological sample or environmental media like air or soil. Um, and then for a broad range of organic chemicals, some of the main ones listed here, legacy uh, organochlorines, uh, or, or persistent organic pollutants, uh, PAHs, which are important for combustion byproducts and things like that. 
Um, if, if the needs go beyond that, we have partnerships with a lot of labs within the U of M, uh, the, the pharmacokinetics and mass spectrometry. They're more about drug delivery, but they can easily uh, modify things to look at toxicokinetics of a, of a chemical, for example. Uh, a lot of our focus I'm talking about today is, or is chemical agents, but we could also connect people with biological or physical agent expertise among our center members, uh, Dr. Shi or, or Neitzel, uh, to get some of those measurements. Uh, metabolomics was just mentioned. That can also be applied for, for exposomics with untargeted uh, metabolomics. So, so that's the that laboratory. Anything for inorganics, there's uh, uh, places we can refer you to for metals and other things. Certain types of water analyses may be better done um, through the College of Engineering on campus. And then finally, NSF International for uh, biomarkers that I worked um, and some others worked with them over many years to develop um, high throughput methods for biomarker measurement, uh, sort of in line with what they use for uh, NHANES at CDC. Um, so a, a broad range of things, pesticides, PAH, phthalates, PFAS, metals, <coughs> et cetera. Um, and Rose knows this well. She was uh, worked with me as project manager at NSF before she moved over here. So she's also very well versed in those, those methods. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail here. This is um, again, the, the lab, managed by, by Stuart and his team. The slides are available. You can check the website uh, for more details if you'd like, but just know they're, they're uh, very high-end equipment, uh, very detailed ability to get peaks and, and good detection limits for a broad range of chemicals. Here are some examples of recent things measured. Again, just showing the broad range of types of chemicals, chemical classes of concern, and types of media that can be uh, measured. Various types of biological samples and again, various types of, of environmental media. And always, if you have an idea of something new that hasn't been done, we can talk through um, the possibility of that. Um, some other examples. So uh, Stuart and his team have been busy on indoor air applications as well as outdoor ambient air applications with a focus on um, pollutant levels, but also environmental justice um, through a lot of the different methods used. Um, and some of that was mentioned in the Community Engagement Core presentation. He also wanted to highlight this uh, Ford vehicle that's outfitted with tons of sampling equipment within it. Um, a lot of it customized to measure things that they wanna measure um, and, and be able to trace, to map things basically, and, and try to determine important sources of various contaminants and pollution. So it has a lot of different things and they can co-locate it to, to, to validate it with other monitoring. And he's proud of this, uh, you know, fancy uh, equipment, but it's all tied in and they have readouts that are easy to, to manage because with all these different types of equipment to go through and, and deal with each one individually over time would, would take uh, uh, a lot of effort. So they've, they've, they've spent a lot of time to make it more uh, efficient. And just some more examples. Um, there's, there's Stuart. Uh, out there hooking up one of his, his monitors and then a couple of examples of mapping, um, you know, with, with handheld monitors or with that van, which is again, more efficient, cover more ground um, with that. Here's an example of formaldehyde and also uh, uh, other air quality uh, measurements. All right, how did I do? Are we on time? 10, 11? Oh. You did after. great, we All were right. behind from the beginning. Okay, okay, everybody, we will return at 1018 um, with a really awesome presentation, so don't leave. Hey, hello everyone. I think we're gonna get started with the translational research team's overview. Dana had already presented somewhat as an overall vision of the translational research team's overview. So this is built around the NIEH strategic plan of promoting translation data to knowledge to action. So I think the goal is to engage members to accelerate public health impact and promote opportunities for collaboration. With this in mind, there are three different teams, the translational teams that have been developed. Uh, one is the toxicologic mechanisms and improving health outcomes of teams. And this particular team is fully based on looking at the mechanistic understanding and trying to find some 
interventions and things that could be taken forward from a clinical as well as a public health standpoint. The second, this is actually led by Laura Shaboda and we, we co-lead this and she will be talking about particular examples and things, what we are trying to achieve with this. And the next theme is the climate change and health disparity scheme. This is led by Toby Lewis and Karina Gronlund. Toby is here and I think he will be presenting it. And the third theme, this one is going to focus on the current impact of climate. It's very topical right now in terms of what we're talking about. And you can see how invested the lead is into this topic. The last one is the cumulative exposures and populations health team. And this is led by Karen Peterson and Erica Jansen. And I think we are trying to, as I mentioned, we are trying to get to the population level and outreach. And she, you know, that's the way we have set this up. So without taking too much time, I'm going to introduce the co-lead Laura Shaboda for the toxicologic mechanisms and improving health outcomes. And she'll be presenting some examples and where ultimately we are trying to collaborate and bring team members, more team members in and how we are going to integrate between teams to reach our end goal. Laura. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really happy to be here this morning. I'm going to talk to you about our toxicological mechanisms and health outcomes team. The overall objective of this team is to advance mechanistic toxicology research that will inform the behavioral, nutritional, and pharmacologic interventions that we need to mitigate the effects of environmental exposures in human populations. And we also want to be able to facilitate this translation of basic fundamental questions into public health impacts. So, we primarily focus on um, developmental environmental exposures and how they impact human health across the life course at different windows of vulnerability. And developmental exposures impact multiple um, tissue and organ systems in the body, <clears throat> as shown here. Um, my work focuses primarily on cardiovascular disease, but we also have several people who are doing work on metabolic syndrome and neuroendocrine um, and neurological, neurodevelopmental outcomes. And um, we have several different models that we use to translate the results of what we find, um, these associations in human population studies, to, um, to mechanistic insights that will allow us to um, develop some of these interventions. We use um, cellular models and organoids. These are human-induced pluripotent stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes that um, I'm working with on my team um, with the help of collaborators from the uh, Frankel Cardiovascular Center. Um, we also uh, work with animal models. Um, our team works with mice, um, Dr. Padabanamans, team works with um, sheep, as I'll talk about in one example. And so, as I mentioned, we have several different models that we can use to explore some of these questions. And one example of this um, ongoing project that's um, one ongoing project that's an example of this um, translation of uh, a mechanistic question into hopefully a public health impact um, is looking at sex-specific effects of lead exposure on cardiac differentiation and function. And so I'm very interested in how chemicals affect males versus females differently. And we know that cardiovascular disease has tremendous, um, tremendous sexual dimorphism and, and sex disparities. And so understanding how chemicals contribute to this, I think is really important. And so one project we have is to use IPS cells derived from male versus female donors to look at how these chemicals affect cardiac differentiation um, using omics technologies in collaboration with the, um, the pods uh, core, um, RNA-seq, DNA methylation, as well as functional studies, again, in collaboration with the cardiovascular center. And we hope to use data from these studies to identify windows of vulnerability and inform development of um, interventions, be they pharmacologic, um, dietary, behavioral, or policy interventions. Um, another project that is ongoing in our group is with Dr. Padamanaban and her team, um, and they are investigating the effects of developmental exposures to biosolids um, on um, health, not only of the 
the off, the direct offspring, but also subsequent generations, the, the grand offspring and great grand offspring. Um, and the NIH R01 um, that, they, that they have is transgenerational consequences of preconceptional and in utero exposure to real life chemical mixtures on fertility and metabolic health. So again, these are, they're looking at a mixture model um, that really is highly environmentally relevant and will um, lead to um, mechanistic insights that we can directly use to impact public health. And they are using a number of different assays, um, metabolic and reproductive, looking at reproductive um, outcomes, epigenetic mechanisms, as well as um, hormonal changes, growth and body composition. And so this is um, kind of an example. We took the translational framework um, paradigm that the NIEHS developed and we took it and made, we put an example of how um, some of our work fits into this paradigm. This is an example of phthalates and cardiac health. Basically, um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but essentially looking at the effects of perinatal exposures on programming and cardiac health and how, do they, how these effects differ by sex. And um, progressing through this paradigm, we hope to um, develop, uh, we hope to, that this will result in changes in clinical outcomes um, and policy decisions that will directly impact public health. And so the goals of the team are to meet regularly to explore new research opportunities, interests and collaborations, discuss funding opportunities, recommend speakers for MLEAD events, um, provide feedback to the center leadership on member research needs and concerns, and promote the translational research vision of the MLEAD center. And that is all I have. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, Dr. Lewis and Dr. Grunlund to talk about climate change and health disparities. Hello, everybody. Hey, uh, thank you for spending your time uh, getting to know the center. Um, I'm Toby Lewis. Uh, Karina is remote, and she is going to be uh, presenting the second half of our uh, discussion or presentation about our research team. Um, I we took a slightly different approach to uh, introducing our research team. Uh, rather than focus uh, as much on the content, we wanted to talk a little bit more about the process and how we hope to engage members of our team uh, and how uh, we envision working together. Uh, so as we are all aware, climate change is here and it is impacting us. This picture was from Puerto Rico just a couple of weeks ago. There are new images coming out today about uh, Hurricane Ian uh, impacting Florida. Um, it's, uh, we've seen flooding here in Detroit. This, these issues are uh, immediate and uh, we're all, I guess it is a uh, unifying, uh, theme that brings our research team together. Uh, climate change doesn't impact everybody equally. There are certain populations that are uh, uh, experiencing more significant impact, and that's where the health disparities application of our team comes. Uh, so just briefly, uh, effects of climate and climate change are location and population specific. Um, and this can take many different forms uh, in terms of weather events, uh, mentioned hurricane and flooding, but also heat. And this has impacts in terms of food insecurity, infectious disease, uh, injuries, medical care disruption. Uh, there are also air quality issues, uh, both in terms of how uh, atmospheric changes impact uh, locally generated uh, air quality uh, sources, but also events like wildfires and uh, other issues in terms oops, of uh, flooding and uh, changes in sea level permafrost and how that impacts both the local populations and the world uh, uh, the world. 
Uh, so moving a little bit more about our vision for what this team will be and what we think the team can do for you. So we primarily want to work on promoting collaboration amongst members, and we're going to do that through quarterly meetings. Um, but we also want to support uh, researchers and research careers. And as we were talking about some of the stresses that uh, climate change can produce, we were talking about some of the stresses that our members uh, potentially are feeling. And we discussed the uh, uh, opportunity to uh, connect members for peer mentorship or accountability buddies, if that's of interest to people. Um, we'll provide platforms for sharing current research, collaborate and brainstorm ideas for future research, uh, facilitate utilization of MLEAD resources, and share information about funding announcements, as well as generating ideas for speakers, seminars, and workshops. So we went into a little more depth about what we want to actually do with these meetings, because we all have plenty of meetings and we want to make these valuable for our members. So this is uh, our vision for our first meeting, which is tentatively going to be in early November. And the idea is let's focus on getting to know each other and getting connected. So who are we? What are our research interests? Um, Karina is going to talk about her research group, which focuses on climate uh, and health impacts, and she can bring up some opportunities, uh, both from the general MLEAD uh, uh, research environment, but also from her group. Uh, we wanted to start a Jamboard to solicit research support needs, ideas for uh, what research support is needed, and also ideas on how we can support each other. And then to break into small roundtables on content topics. And I just listed some here. And then the idea would be that each member would I identify one other person in the team that they would want to have future conversations with, with the idea that that would then happen as people were interested uh, and could develop further. Um, our second meeting is uh, going to focus on diversity, both on the populations that we are studying, the engagement, uh, with community, the community uh, engagement core, but also on our own diversity and how we can support our own diverse members. Uh, uh, we'll try, we'll bring in some guest speakers to talk about disparity populations on multiple different dimensions, uh, particularly focusing uh, on race, racism, and racialization. Uh, and then talk about how this impacts the ideas that we bring to our research for studying climate change and health disparity with a focus on intervention research and how do we, that translational piece, how do we make our research as relevant and impactful as possible? Uh, what are the needs of our diverse researchers and how do we foster more diverse collaborations, and then uh, what are best practices for community and stakeholder engagement. Beyond that, it's what the research team members want, and we will be responsive to research uh, team member input. Uh, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Karina. Yeah, thanks, Toby. Uh, sorry I couldn't be there today. I was looking forward to coffee with old friends and making new ones. Um, so um, some other things that we wanted to do in our quarterly meetings um, were to work on work-life sustainability issues and this idea of accountability buddies. And, and this is uh, building on the theme of mental health that was in the P30 Center meeting in New York recently. We want to promote member productivity and sustainable and fulfilling careers and also personal well-being. And so this is, you know, this is optional, but available for those who are interested. We were thinking of having small groups of about two to five people working on similar work tasks or work-life balance goals. And they can provide peer support to manage multiple priorities, dedicate time to writing and meet deadlines while still being human and taking care of themselves. And we wanna tap into resources from the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity the University of Michigan Faculty Development Resources and also M Healthy. 
So we, we wanted to end with thoughts on what we can all do about climate change. And climate change mitigation and adaptation really cuts across a lot of our research interests. Climate change mitigation involves reducing greenhouse gas emissions across all sectors, including the transportation and residential sectors. These reductions have health co-benefits in the form of reduced toxic air pollution emissions, which many of us are studying, and then more, also more active forms of transportation. Climate change adaptation involves for example, increasing access to cool spaces by either increasing air conditioning access in home for those for whom it's most appropriate, but also increasing cooling center availability and access and reducing allergen exposure and effects. And that includes mold from flooding in homes and basements and also improving heat health warning systems. And then to give you just a flavor of what we wanna talk about in our first quarterly meeting in terms of existing climate change and health research on campus. Um, we currently have two research projects with Marie O'Neill and other colleagues on campus looking at interventions related to climate change mitigation and, and adaptation in the home. And specifically, we're looking at the health and well-being benefits of a sustainability case manager, who's someone who comes into your home and helps identify energy efficiency and weatherization programs that you might be eligible for. And that project is funded by the NSF. And we also have a five-year R01 looking at the health benefits of weatherization in three US cities. Thanks. Great, and now our third research team, um, Erica and Karen, if you'd like to speak, I'll control the slides for you. All right, thank you so much. Um, looks like my video is loading. There we go. Um, so my name is Erica Jansen um, and Karen Peterson will also be talking um, at the end, but we're both from the faculty at the Nutritional Law Sciences Department. Um, and so I know we don't have a lot of time, but we'll basically, I'll start off by got, kind of going into our overarching research interests and some of the methodologies and cohorts um, that we primarily use. And then Karen will go into more of the translational piece and kind of our vision. Um, for this team. So the cumulative exposures that um, we're really interested in include metals, endocrine disrupting chemicals, and pesticides. And we look at how these toxicants affect um, health in a lot of different ways, but primarily cardiometabolic health. And we look at um, them through the frameworks of the DOHAD hypothesis. So thinking about um, really sensitive periods in um, the life course that affect um, later health and disease. And then um, thinking about this through life course epidemiology. So looking not only at you know, individual um, sensitive periods, but thinking about it longitudinally. Uh, and especially from our lens of nutritional sciences, we're really interested in how lifestyle uh, behaviors, especially diet, um, they interact with toxicants. So we know that diet is uh, both a source of toxicant exposures, but um, it may also be an important effects modifier um, for the relationships between toxicants and metabolic health. And we're also very interested in um, thinking about sleep and physical activity as potential modifiers. Um, and for sleep, I, we're also interested in, in thinking about how uh, toxicants might affect um, sleep. All right, we go on to the next one. So uh, the cohort study that we primarily um, work with is the element study. So this is a study, a birth cohort study from Mexico City. Um, we now have three generations um, in this cohort study. And as a part of a um, data or a cohort maintenance grant, um, we now have um, enhanced data sharing. So um, people who, you know, members who have not worked with the element um, cohort study before, we hope that it's it's easier for you to access the data. Um, and we're all, always um, really interested in um, collaborating. And as evidence of this, we um, now have other Latin American um, collaborations and, and we're seeking ways to try to integrate data um, and, you know, compare and contrast um, toxicological data. Uh, so we know that there are 
a lot of sister cohorts, both um, you know within the M lead, um, but also outside of it that have similar types of data that might be um, really good to integrate um, and work with, including um, those listed on there, SWAN, NESMIX, um, GOX is a Chilean cohort, um, et cetera. And um, some of the research methods that we use, so like I mentioned, trying to harmonize data across cohorts so that we can um, create larger data sets and to really compare and contrast across populations. Um, some of the statistical approaches um, that we work on, especially with Dr. Peter Song and his collaborators, looking at high dimensional mediators and um, different ways to cluster and look at interactions between um, toxicants and diet or other um, effects modifiers. We also have um, sort of a newer area in our research, which, which is trying to incorporate mixed methods research and, and using both um, qualitative and ethnographic data in relation to epidemiologic data and, and um, finding ways that we can um, gain more um, comprehensive understanding of toxicants. And also taking, um, you know, doing a better job of looking at social and economic stressors um, in, and we have um, recent collaborations actually with economists at, um, at the, Institute, at the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico, um, trying to, to look at this more systematically. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen. Great. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Erica. And also wish I were there in person next time. Um, so I won't go, uh, Lori previously showed this um, very elegant and honestly overwhelming translational framework for NIHS. I um, will just say a couple additional things about it. It's um, it's actually been very useful to us. And I appreciated Lori's example of, of phthalates and uh, cardio cardiometabolic outcomes. Um, we have had other examples that are most evident relating lead exposure, but it lends itself very well to the kind of collaborations that are in and lead. So moving all the way from the mouse model, cell model, human observational studies, potentially interventions, and then options for translation to policy. So um, I won't dive more into it. I guess the only other thing I would flag is we have found it helpful because it's so prioritized by NIHS to allude specifically to this in grant proposals that we are submitting for funding. So I think that's a, um, something we could share among the teams. So um, just a couple more slides in interest of time. So um, as I mentioned, lead is, you know, elements started out in the mid 1990s, looking at the potential for calcium supplementation to block resorption of bone during pregnancy to some extent or slow it. And that would then reduce um, release of lead that had been stored in bone and subsequently reduce amounts in breast milk mm -hmm. and it also in um, maternal blood lead. And the original emphasis was on neurodevelopmental outcomes. And then later we started to look at growth and sexual maturation. Over the last 10 to 12 years, um, and this is just one example, we know there are others from the sister cohorts, so it'll be um, fun and interesting and I think important to elicit those stories from the other cohorts. Um, in 2012, some of the work that was done on lead during pregnancy in Element directly informed the CDC's guidelines, which are actually still current for identification and management of lead exposure in pregnant and lactating women. And, um, the um, work on lead, as well as related work through a project Erica mentioned, NESMEX, which Jackie Goodrich, Deb, Walk, uh, Deb Watkins um, are two of the center members involved in that, which is a, a parallel, it's a project done in element participants that look at water quality. So um, I'm going into too many details, too much information. What's shown on the right is our most recent evidence of how the research can be translated. So. What you're seeing here is the, uh, in Spanish, the um, new um, National Nutrition Survey questionnaire. And um, it has incorporated five new questions on water quality that were directly informed by NESMEX and research in the element participants. And um, if we're successful in getting our, our renewal of our, our cohort maintenance grant, 
those data will actually be integrated in the element database. So they will, on 60 families, they will be available for um, use by people who would like to apply to use them. Everybody in the center would be welcome. And we, there are also questions now on lead exposure that have never before appeared in the National Nutrition Survey in Mexico will be asked on the next go round. So with that, we could go to the very last slide, Rose, if you don't mind. Is um, what's next? So um, I think both Lori and Karina and Toby um, went into a, a you know the a really great, wonderful amount of detail on um, different processes. So I think we'll just emphasize again: we're very interested. We'll probably meet late, no, mid to late November. Co-create vision and activities for the team. Um, prioritize some common research themes. So we, you know, threw out ones that were important to us, but I think we we can look across the different co um, sister cohorts and interests that members have. Um, the other thing is, um, Erica went over some of the methods. I think with, particularly with our enhanced data sharing that's mandated through our cohort maintenance grant, we have some opportunities in terms of um, looking at some of the pesky methodologic issues like high dimensional um, mediators, but also we'll also be integrating uh, qualitative ethnographic data, which is, um, you know, really interesting body of data to have in a cohort database. So those all seem fruitful for potential cross, you know, member exploration. Um, and um, finally, one approach we've used is just to define one or more projects we can actually work on together. I mean, often this is a manuscript and that sometimes can take a lot of energy, but I think we would like to see it as a, as a co-creating group uh, and really a work group. And then we'll borrow some of the accountability buddy uh, work from the other groups. So I think that's all I'll have to say. Thank you. Great, thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to thank Lori, uh, Toby, uh, Karina, Erica, and Karen for really giving a flavor of the various range of studies that are ongoing. It opens up room for a lot of collaborations, a lot of animal studies. People are focusing on one organ system. They are archiving other organ systems, which people can think about looking into integrating. Same with a lot of the cohort studies. I think we have samples collected across multiple spectrum. You can reach out to various people. Look out in the near future. We are going to be calling for meetings with the groups, and we're going to be sending emails for opening up collaborations and letting you know what is available so you can reach out and you can expand and reach our ultimate goal of policy. So change. Thank you. All right. I am back for a quick update about what our programs have been doing in the last three months since we got the notice of award on June 16th. I wanted to thank you all for your um, continuing attention. I know this is a lot of information thrown at you in a short two hours, but I could not get this group together for more than two hours. So we appreciate <laughs> you, you listening quickly. Um, the administrative core is the structure that um, oversees the center and our um, programs. And I'd like to start by acknowledging both Rose and John Meeker for working really hard over the last three months to administer an expedited pilot program project. And so each year we will issue RFAs for short-term projects. The goal is to bring new investigators to the field, forge new research collaborations, address the priorities of the Keck and the Stakeholder Advocacy Board, um, challenge current science paradigms and test novel approaches. And so I'm really happy to announce um, publicly that in the last few weeks, we've been able to fund five amazing awards, which you will see here in the boxes. Uh, we're really grateful to the pilot pro pro project program, as well as all of our applicants for working with us on a really tight timeline. The notice of award came later than we expected. And um, you also have the privilege now of, of spending out all this money in less than a year. Um, really apologize. If anyone has a way to work around this, uh, contact me afterwards. So congratu congratulations to our members, Amy Schultz, Sean Harris, Shin Wang, Aurora Lay, and Lori Sabota for their recent pilot grants.
I'd also like to spend a moment to congratulate two additional individuals, and these are our two new center scientists. Um, to begin, I wanted to acknowledge the leadership of our career development program by Gil Oman, who is here in the room, and Justin Colosino, who is one of those lucky people who is out in Athens and Portugal for the um, environmental epidemiology and exposure science meetings. They have been working really hard since our notice of award came in to administer this year's Center Scientist Program. So I'm really happy to reintroduce you to our first awardee, which is Rebecca Beck Petroff. Um, who is here in the room. Uh, Rebecca is a toxicologist who came to the University of Michigan a few years ago to work with Jackie Goodrich and learn environmental epidemiology. And now she is combining both of these fields for her center scientist work, which is in the developmental origins of disease in DNA and hydroxymethylation. And then second um, to introduce Vivica, Sangare Gareg, who is also here in the room. And um, Sangari was working on that project that you just heard from the translational research teams that involves the biosolids and the um, sheet model. So congratulations to you both. We look forward to working with you over the year. Both of our center scientists will be engaged with our cores and programs. And I encourage all of our members to reach out. This is the future of Emily. And as you will see today, several of our former center scientists, as Dr. Oman pointed out to me during our short break, are now leaders in MLEAD. Um, so just to be to um, end, I want to thank everyone. I had planned to start with a round of applause at the beginning and had forgotten, but virtual round of applause, everybody, for all of their dedication in getting MLEAD refunded. Um, as you see, saw today, we saw parts, and I hope you can see that all these parts are, um, lead to a greater sum. Um, we will um, be issuing our monthly newsletter in addition to the new Twitter account that you just saw from the Keck, um, which is Michigan Environmental Health for All. We maintain a center um, Twitter account, MLEAD. So I encourage you to join up and follow both of those. And um, I also would like to acknowledge all of the hard work by Robin Wiley, who is here not only administering our AV for our webinars um, and hybrid events, but also for working on our new MLEAD website. Um, so please join us for upcoming webinars and stay tuned through all the information you'll get into your inbox. Um, and now it is my pleasure um, to turn the podium over to Dr. Simone Charles. As you've um, seen in, in quickly in um, snapshots here today, our center embraces all issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we have a reputation for this at NIEHS. And because of this, Simone was invited to present this presentation to all of the core centers in New York City in July. And it was really wonderful. And we've asked her to come back and do a version here today. Thank you very much, Dr. Charles. All right, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate being here. Forgive my voice. I'm operating on, I think, about three hours sleep. So I uh, appreciate being here. Um, thanks for having me again. Um, as Dana mentioned, this presentation was given in New York and it was part of a panel of amazing people um, around enhancing workforce inclusivity, um, addressing recruitment, retention, and career development. But if you notice, my title starts with workforce diversity. On the road to scientific workforce diversity, many paths, one destination. And I wanted to highlight that I've underlined those two words because I feel like they're interrelated. So there was a reason why my title moved into diversity, but you'll see me bring up inclusivity. All right, so these are just a few thoughts. So. The key points I'll be covering today are what are my initial thoughts, um, and as they always say, this does not represent the voice of the XX, right? So these are my initial thoughts, and then I'll start with a say what. Um, it gives a little bit about the data and where things stand. And then what is inclusivity versus diversity? Are they really that different? What's the value of all of that? Some of the promising strategies from the literature and even for us from communication, and then what's the destination that we are really trying to go to? So 
I'll start with my initial thoughts. And when I started this presentation, I really had a hard time figuring out how to start it. So I started it with myself. Every Sunday, I typically read, to, um, well, one or two Sundays a month, I read to Detroit kids or within the metro Detroit area. And we choose books typically written by either minority authors or focusing on a cultural theme, always with positive messaging. And so this is one of the little books that we've read so far, Ada Twist Scientist, and I love it. And the kids have loved it. And what it focuses on is this young girl, very young, but she's very interested in everything. She constantly asks questions. And I thought to myself, that's actually all that scientists are. They ask questions and seek answers. And most children, if any of you have, I know some of you in the room, I know your kids, I know you have kids. They ask a million and one questions. I have a nephew and since he's been born, he asks a million and one questions. And so very naturally kids are in that space, but then over time, something happens, particularly with minority kids. They, we lose them somewhere along and we talk about it as a leaky pipeline and that leaky pipeline is happening all the way from the time they're born all the way till we see them not represented in faculty numbers right um, let's take a minute and just look around the room right so we're not seeing it in our faculty numbers and so where what's happening over time and so I don't bring this up to burden us this actually should engage us to make us think more about how are we doing this? And it really should excite us to begin doing the work in this space. And I think the Emily Center is doing that. Because again, if you look around the room, who's, who's at the table, we look at our center scientists for this year, you look at the center scientists over time. So this talk is really focusing a little bit on, on that. All right, so it's, it's engaging us and getting us excited for the work. All right, so a little bit about the say what. So I wasn't sure how to present this data. And so I, I thought, well, what, 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 what do we want to put? And so that's why I have to say what. So I brought back up the, um, the leaky pipeline, because what it shows here is that this pipeline is happening all through the life stages, so to speak, which is a big tenant of the Emily Center. And the, but the NIH has a scientific diversity toolkit, which is a really great toolkit if you get a chance to look at it. I have it in the references here, but it focuses a lot on the tailpipe of the pipeline. And what I'm trying to say today is that that should really occur across the whole pipeline. I added this slide last night because I wanted us to take a look at what our student numbers look like in the School of Public Health, which is the bed of the Emily Center. And we see it compared to the national estimates that we are doing well in some areas, but we do have some work to do. Hence the value of what we're talking about, which gets us into a little bit into, let's step back and define these two. So inclusivity and diversity. At the summer meeting, um, Dr. Kenneth Olden made a statement and I quickly typed it and he said, um, diversity is a view of inclusion, includes everyone in the working class, irrespective of race and ethnicity. And I thought that was a really good point to raise. That is really about everyone at the table. And so the Oxford Dictionary defines inclusivity as the practice or policy of providing equal access to opportunities and resources for people who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized, such as those having physical or mental disability or belonging to other minority groups. And that definition stood out for me. And a few things in that definition I wanted to highlight. So practice or policy. Practice means an intentional action. Right, both that and policy, that's an intentional action. Then equal access, what does that actually mean? What does equal access get us to? That means opening the doors to everyone as Dr. Olden talked about. Opportunities and resources. So you know, it's more than opening the door, it's allowing someone upstairs. And I always think about it in that way. So what are the opportunities and resources made available and to whom? And then otherwise excluded or marginalized. Again, as we think about inclusivity and diversity, we think about action, right? We talked about being, oh, sorry, being energized in this work, right? So it takes action and both exclusion and marginalization are action terms. It's an intentional removal or exclusion of someone from a space. It's also marginalizations is intentionally putting them to the side. And so as we look at inclusivity and diversity, we have to look at these things. 
And really inclusivity and diversity have to work hand in hand. And that's why in an inclusivity um, panel, I brought up diversity because we have to increase diversity and create an inclusive culture. So they cannot operate separately, they actually work together. Um, and in order to increase diversity, we have to be inclusive. And in order to be inclusive, we actually have to increase the diversity. Right? And so what is the value, the why? Why are we doing this? And so we know that in order to address health disparities, we have to create a population that looks like the people we're trying to serve. And we saw that in the pandemic. We saw the value of that in the pandemic, right? And so it's inclusion in reducing health inequities, the value of the research that we're doing. Um, Dr. Lewis talked a little bit about creating those little huddles of bringing people together um, to discuss what are relevant and stuff like that. It's that kind of work of bringing people together to address uh, health disparities. We, it also impacts research impact, translation, and implementation into communities. And then it improves the workplace itself, the workplace climate and the culture, particularly for all, um, for our students, for our faculty, uh, particularly those underrepresented, those coming in, and those already there. All right, so when should this happen? Now, MLEAD is a center that looks at life stages. And I believe that it really should happen as we saw in the pipeline happening all the way from birth to death. It's like at the same time, we have to look at diversity in that way. And as I mentioned before, that NIH framework that we saw earlier is embedded in later stages, but I do believe it has to expand across that life stage, right? In order for us to have true impact. All right, so here are some promising strategies. I know I don't have a lot of time, so Rose, please keep me on time. Um, here are some promising strategies that are coming out of the White House and out of NIH literature. And so we look at pathways, increasing pathways, providing access, doing in, uh, intentional recruitment. Once we recruit, doing intentional retention. And then this part we often forget that it's important to create sponsorship, so to speak. So it's about achievement and advancement once we have there, which will help with retention and recruitment as well. And that's across the lines. And so some of the other promising strategies is around creating a good climate. And I use balloons here because I felt like we need to rise to this, right? We're rising, we're getting there. And so it's about climate, public health identity. We talk about a science identity a lot. My nephew asked me recently because I used the term with him and he asked me, what does that mean? Um, and that's so critical. So I changed it into a public health identity. It's we, the people or the, 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 the yeah, I'll put people because it's across the life stages. Children, students, faculty need to be able to see themselves as thriving scholars in this space. And that is within STEM or within public health, creating that identity, strong mentorship and true mentorship. Um, focusing on the underrepresented, the um, NIH and the White House focus on having that intentional partnership with MSI or my minority serving institutions is a really great way. Enhancing on enhancing networks, doing near peer mentoring. Um, another one I want to cultivate partnerships. That's all about that advancement. Um, we talked about sponsorship, appropriate training, even things like implicit bias across our students, faculty, staff, um, uh, culturally relevant experiences. That's part of creating a public health identity. Um, when you could see yourself as a public health professional and it, because it's relevant to your space, your experiences and so on. It tends to keep students in, keep people engaged in the space. All right, so I wanted to highlight a little bit of the work of MLEAD and how they are doing some aspects of this. And so um, I wanted to point out that MLEAD is actually supporting the work of uh, Dr. Natalie Sampson, who I don't see in the room today, but Natalie runs ERA, which is Environmental Health Research to Action. It's for 16 to 18 year olds. It's a two week intensive program. It focuses on environmental justice, brings in community youth and community issues, environmental mental health advocacy, and the, she's now creating a, a curriculum that will move into the K through 12 system. And so Emily is supporting this work. So that's 
part of pipe, um, plug in that pipeline. The direct support again for Emily, they provided for um, center scientists and mentioned that earlier, intentional mentorship through Dr. Gail Oman and Dr. Colosino. I know I've benefited from that. Expanding networks across people, helping with grant writing support that all allows people to achieve. Um, Emily also assists other grants. So for example, Dr. O'Neill and myself, we have an R25 where we intentionally partner with MSIs as I mentioned earlier um, as an important tenant of this work. And the Emily Center provided over half of the labs that we were, were able to send our students to in last summer. And so we thank you for that as well. And then I wanted to point out some SPH institutional work that's going on. Um, there's something called Pathways to Public Health, which is our Dean's initiative. And I serve as the director for that, where we work with increasing access and doing all of these key things that I talked about earlier to create career preparedness and open access and advancement and recruitment retention with intentional partnerships um, to increase, um, and increase diversity and inclusivity in, in public health. Um, all right, some other things that I wanted to point out is being intentional about your partnerships as well. And so the institution and making this institutional um, moves it away from symbolic change into substantive systemic change when we actually tie these to goals. Which brings me to the next slide, which talks about this has to be tied to our goals. Most grants that we write for NIH, we put a logic model in. So we understand the importance and we have an evaluation plan. So we understand the importance of measuring our successes, yet we don't often measure our successes in this space of diversity and inclusivity. So how do we know we're meeting the benchmarks? And so this is an important part as well of everything that we do. We should be moving this needle and as well as tying it to rewards and consequences so that we really energize people to actually pay attention in this space. And so I wanted to again close with a little bit about myself. One of the books that I read to the, to the kids um, this last Christmas, and I know it's Christmas, but we're almost in October. The temperatures feel like Christmas, so we're here. I wanted to bring up this one, and I really like this book because it talked about a, 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 a family that was destitute. They didn't have much for Christmas, so you see the little tree only had one little bob that was all they could afford. They didn't have meals, um, nothing for Christmas, and so a little boy looked in the window of his neighbor, and he noticed that, and so he went home and told his mom, who made one call to some one. And that person made one call and each person in the neighborhood, just one person brought one thing. And so that family at their Christmas had a really re refreshing and rewarding Christmas. They had everything they needed because one person made one decision. And so the, the, the book ends with, and I, I, forgive me for moving pages, but I, I really like the quote. So I want to make sure to say it. And it says here, never think that one voice is too small to make a difference. And I feel that as the, as the Emily Center gets launched at new funding, which I congratulate everybody in the room and all the leaders and Dr. Dolanoy around, um, the, great, the M30 Center has a great opportunity to impact diversity and inclusion for, for promoting inclusive excellence and to be a positive voice in this work. And so thank you so much for having me again. Thank you, Dr. Dolanoy. Thank you to all the leaders of the Emily Center. There are my references there, uh, but the, the major ones and thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right, we reached the end. Only um, a few minutes over our plan time. I would like to thank everyone who came to the podium or to the Zoom room to speak today. And um, now we have time just to mingle. Um, for those of us here in the room, there are refreshments. For those of you on Zoom, please let us know if you'd like us to open a um, breakout room for you all to chat more. And um, on behalf of the whole MLEAD Center, I'm really looking forward to the next five years. And hopefully we will have more time together than we've had in the last uh, two and a half years. With that, have a wonderful afternoon. Enjoy the sunshine for those of us who are here in Michigan. And we are thinking of all of those who are affected by the storms and the hurricanes that are going out throughout the world. Good afternoon. Yes, thank you.